Free frame number five. Errors in cognition. Are we cognitively impaired? The nature of the human brain and consciousness makes us susceptible to numerous processing errors. Knowing about these errors makes it possible to avoid them. Ignorance guarantees we will fall into their traps. This reality should make us more humble and circumspect. Whenever we make a decision, assert an opinion, buy a product, start a new enterprise, marry someone, choose a career, or take any fork in the road, this reframe reminds us of the stark reality that we have inherent defects that compromise our ability to think. It reminds us to be more skeptical and critical of our thinking, feelings, and actions as we might with the opinions and decisions of other people in our lives with whom we have issues and even a lack of respect. So how is our cognition impaired? The first way is that our memories are very unreliable and that defect will be the subject of part one of reframe number five. The second way is that we can only think coherently of one thing at a time. And that defect will be the subject of part two of reframe number five. We'll begin with part one and explore the fallibility of our memories. A huge amount of research has shown that we do not have perfect recall. Far from it. In fact, long is the list of people who have been falsely accused and convicted because of erroneous eyewitness testimony. Faulty eyewitness testimony has been implicated in at least 75% of DNA exoneration cases, more than any other cause. In a particularly famous case, a man named Ronald Cotton was identified by a rape victim, Jennifer Thompson, as her rapist, and he was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. After more than 10 years, he was exonerated and the real rapist identified based on DNA evidence. For details on this case and other relatively lucky individuals whose false convictions were subsequently overturned with DNA evidence, see the Innocence Project website. Our memories are not only subject to distortion at the time they are recorded, but also as they are stored with the passage of time and even when they are reconstructed upon recall. So we are basing our thinking and actions upon this trifecta of defective processing and end up with very imperfect analog data. Garbage in, garbage out. No wonder our thinking and the fruit of that thinking so often misses the mark and causes so much misery and suffering as a result. Let's explore these three aspects of memory distortion in more detail. We create memories by encoding sensory information from the world into our brains. Errors can occur in this biochemical and electrical process, depending upon the state of the underlying metabolic machinery and infrastructure of the nervous system. For example, is enough acetylcholine present in the right synapses? Where is the organism focusing its attention at the moment of the event? 
What is the organism's past psychological history and emotional state at the moment of the event? These are just a few of the factors that can affect how a memory is recorded. An analogy. Using a filter in your cell phone photo app that bakes in a diffused background or lighting effect into the recorded photo. People are inadvertently and unconsciously applying their own personal filters when they encode the events in their lives. Another analogy, taking a picture with a defective camera and or lens which distorts or mars the resulting picture. After a memory is recorded, how is it stored and recalled? Does the nervous system store the encoded memory trace in an impregnable vault and defend it against any form of molecular degradation? Or is it more like a vinyl record album that gets modified, worn down, and distorted each time it is replayed. We've all heard the term neuroplasticity, which is the ability of the brain to form and reorganize synaptic connections, especially in response to learning or experience or following injury. Does this process extend to our memories as well? Do our memories change with time? And are they modified by subsequent events and experiences? Are they subject to errors when they are reconstructed by the act of recall? They definitely do. And this is called the misinformation effect. We don't remember events exactly as they were. Memories are reconstructed each time they are remembered, using those encoded memory traces in your own guesswork. That's why psychologist Elizabeth Loftus compares memory to a Wikipedia page. You can edit it, but that means other people can too, who are not always correct. Hundreds of studies have demonstrated the misinformation effect. Here are a few examples. In an early study of eyewitness memory, undergraduate subjects first watched a slideshow depicting a small red car driving and then hitting a pedestrian. Some subjects were then asked leading questions about what had happened in the slides. For example, subjects were asked, how fast was the car traveling when it passed the yield sign? But this question was actually designed to be misleading because the original slide included a stop sign rather than a yield sign. Later, subjects were shown pairs of slides. One of the pair was the original slide containing the stop sign. The other was a replacement slide containing a yield sign. Subjects were asked which of the pair they had previously seen. Subjects who had been asked about the yield sign were likely to pick the slide showing the yield sign, even though they had originally seen the slide with the stop sign. In other words, the misinformation in the leading question led to inaccurate memory. This phenomenon is called the misinformation effect because the misinformation that subjects were exposed to after the event, here in the form of a misleading question, apparently contaminates subjects' memories of what they witnessed. Hundreds of subsequent studies have demonstrated that memory can be contaminated by erroneous information that people are exposed to after they witness an event. The misinformation in these studies has led people to incorrectly remember everything from small but crucial details 
of a perpetrator's appearance to objects as large as a barn that wasn't there at all. These studies have demonstrated that young adults, the typical research subjects in psychology, are often susceptible to misinformation, but that children and older adults can be even more susceptible. In addition, misinformation effects can occur easily and without any intention to deceive. Even slight differences in the wording of a question can lead to misinformation effects. Subjects of one study were more likely to say yes when asked, did you see the broken headlight? Then when asked, did you see a broken headlight? Other studies have shown that misinformation can corrupt memory even more easily when it is encountered in social situations. This is a problem, particularly in cases where more than one person witnesses a crime. In these cases, witnesses tend to talk to one another in the immediate aftermath of the crime, including as they wait for police to arrive. But because different witnesses are people with different perspectives, they are likely to see or notice different things and thus remember different things, even when they witness the same event. So when witnesses communicate about the crime later, they not only reinforce common memories of the event, they also contaminate each other's memory about the event. The misinformation effect has been modeled in the laboratory. Researchers had subjects watch a video in pairs. Both subjects sat in front of the same screen, but because they wore differently polarized glasses, they saw two different versions of the same video projected onto a screen. So, although they were both watching the same screen and believed quite reasonably that they were watching the same video, they were actually watching two different versions of the video. In the video, Eric, an electrician, is seen wandering through an unoccupied house and helping himself to the contents thereof. A total of eight details were different between the two videos. After watching the videos, the co-witnesses worked together on 12 memory test questions. Four of these questions dealt with details that were different in the two versions of the video. So subjects had the chance to influence one another. Then subjects worked individually on 20 additional memory test questions. Eight of these were for details that were different in the two videos. Subjects accuracy was highly dependent on whether they had discussed the details previously. Their accuracy for items that they had not previously discussed with their co-witness was 79%. Items that they had discussed, their accuracy dropped markedly to 34%. That is, subjects allowed their co-witnesses to unwittingly corrupt their memories for what they had seen. Some memory errors are so large that they almost belong in a class of their own, false memories. Back in the early 1990s, a pattern emerged whereby people would go into therapy for depression and other everyday problems, but over the course of the therapy, develop memories for violent and horrible victimhood. These patients, therapists, claimed that the patients were recovering genuine memories of real childhood abuse buried deep in their minds for years or even decades. But some experimental psychologists believed that the memories were instead likely to be falsely created in therapy. These researchers then set out to see 
whether it would indeed be possible for wholly false memories to be created by procedures similar to those used in these patients' therapy. In early false memory studies, undergraduate subjects, family members, were recruited to provide events from the students' lives. The student subjects were told that the researchers had talked to their family members and learned about four different events from their childhood. The researchers asked if the undergraduate students remembered each of these four events, introduced via short hints. The subjects were asked to write about each of the four events in a booklet and then were interviewed two separate times. The trick was that one of the events came from the researchers rather than the family. And the family had actually assured the researchers that this event had not happened to the subject. In the first such study, this research introduced event was a story about being lost in a shopping mall and rescued by an older adult. In this study, after just being asked whether they remembered these events occurring on three separate occasions, a quarter of subjects came to believe that they had indeed been lost in the mall. In subsequent studies, similar procedures were used to get subjects to believe that they had nearly drowned and had been rescued by a lifeguard or that they had spilled punch on the bride's parents at a family wedding, or that they had been attacked by a vicious animal as a child, among other events. More recent false memory studies have used a variety of different manipulations to produce false memories in substantial minorities and even occasional majorities of manipulated subjects. For example, one group of researchers used a mock advertising study wherein subjects were asked to review fake advertisements for Disney vacations to convince subjects that they had once met the character Bugs Bunny at Disneyland. An impossible false memory because Bugs is a Warner Brothers character, not Disney. Another group of researchers photoshopped childhood photographs of their subjects into a hot air balloon picture and then asked the subjects to try to remember and describe their hot air balloon experience. Other researchers gave subjects unmanipulated class photographs from their childhoods along with a fake story about a class prank, and thus enhanced the likelihood that subjects would falsely remember the prank. Using a false feedback manipulation, researchers have been able to persuade subjects to falsely remember having a variety of childhood experiences. In these studies, subjects are told falsely that a powerful computer system has analyzed questionnaires that they completed previously and has concluded that they had a particular experience years earlier. Subjects apparently believed what the computer said about them and adjusted their memories to match this new information. A variety of different false memories have been implanted in this way. In some studies, subjects are told they once got sick on a particular food. These false past memories can then affect future perceptions, such as whether a certain food may taste good or not. Other false memories implanted with this methodology include having an unpleasant experience with the character Pluto at Disneyland and witnessing physical violence between one's parents. Importantly, once these false memories are implanted, whether through complex methods or simple ones, 
it is extremely difficult to tell them apart from true memories. Consider the implications of all this. If we base our thinking upon our memories, and those memories are changing and degrading with the passage of time and the accumulation of new experiences, perhaps we should be a little more humble and circumspect in asserting our views. The most basic units of our cognitive process are but shifting sands that are morphing, disappearing, and spontaneously appearing beyond our control and awareness. Opinionated people would do well to learn more about this fundamental underlying basis for many of their opinions.